Here to give an overview of hemp production, as mentioned, I've been working with hemp for a while at the University of Kentucky. I started up last February at Central State. Um, and so really trying to get this established as a crop for the state of Ohio. Um, and so we're just gonna cover a little bit about what the crop is, um, it's got a lot of unique things with it that's very different than any other crop that you're going to encounter out um, uh, in Ohio or anywhere for that matter. It's a very unique plant and um, so with that comes a lot of challenges but it also makes it very interesting to work with. Uh, so this is a hemp plant. Uh, a lot of people see that and they think uh, marijuana plant and there's a reason for that. They're actually both cannabis sativa plants, um, taxonomists differ on how many types of cannabis there are, but um, legally there's just one. And so it could, they could look identical. Um, it used to be thought that, okay, you could tell grain and fiber type hemp plants from uh, marijuana plants just by how they were being produced, how they're being grown, and there's some accuracy in that. Uh, but a lot of what we're actually, uh, people are growing for in the U.S. at the moment is for the cannabinoids. And those are medicinal compounds produced in the flowers. And those are produced in the same way, in, the, in fashion, as uh, THC or tetrahydrocannabinol, the intoxicating component of cannabis. And so uh, we'll talk more about that as we go along uh, and how you actually determine the differences between the two. But... Um, just a quick overview of the plant itself. It's what we call a summer annual, meaning it's an annual plant. It um, uh, grows up during the summer versus being in the fall, the spring or the fall. Um, most of its active growth is during the summer. It can get anywhere from three to 15 plus feet tall, depending on the variety that you're using. Um, and that comes down to really the type of application you're looking at um, for growing the plant for. Um, it is only distinguished from marijuana by the level of the THC in it. Um, its closest relative is actually hops. Um, they're, um, and that's a, kind of a distant, somewhat distant relative, and they're, those two, there's nothing really even close to them. Um, so it's a very unique plant. And it has a long history of use by humans. It's, we've got artifacts um, made with hemp that date back over 10,000 years from Europe and, um, and China. and places in Asia. So um, it's had a long history of use, um, but it's uh, had a very complex history in the U.S. Um, in colonial times, it, uh, hemp production was real common. Uh, it was a central commodity during the uh, what we call the age of exploration when countries were sending out ships to colonize new areas um, and start essentially starting um, uh, new colonies leading to new countries and that was because it was a critical opponent of the ship rigging and, as well as the uh, fibers um, were used so the fibers were used in that rope for the rigging as well as the canvas on the sails and so it was an essential commodity and a key commodity during that point in time and so most colonies actually were established with hemp production in mind. Um, it was produced until the mid-1950s in the, the U.S. and then in the 1970s the Controlled Substance Act came around and um, it included a provision while it exempts hemp fiber and non-viable seeds um, for grain. Um, it includes viable seeds and all leaf material under the definition of marijuana and so that makes it very difficult to grow a plant if you don't have a part of a plant or a seed to start with. And so that was effectively a prohibition against the crop, even though it wasn't um, necessarily its direct intent, per se. Um, with that, um, other countries kept growing hemp. There were some countries that had banned hemp and they were coming back to it, um, such as Canada and Europe. And in 2014, um, there were states that were really looking at, okay, why are we not growing hemp when we're importing all this material from foreign countries? We could be growing this um, in the U.S., giving American farmers another crop opportunity instead of uh, just having to rely on international sources for this kind of material. And so there was a research program that began in 2014 with that farm bill. 
um, distinguishing hemp from marijuana. And so with that, uh, we're able to do research into hemp. It didn't remove it from the Controlled Substance Act. It just made an exemption um, for hemp um, in a research context. Uh, and that was essentially when I got involved uh, with hemp production in Kentucky. In 2018, though, the Farm Bill, because of the success of the 2014 hemp, uh, Farm Bill's hemp research program, removed, officially removed hemp from the list of controlled substances. And so now it's illegal at a federal level. Ohio still had a little bit of work to do, though. Um, we had to, states have duplicate um, regulations for their Controlled Substance Act, so it was listed both at a federal level for marijuana, but also at the state level. And so we needed to remove that from the state definition to be able to take place that in Ohio. And so that was done the end of, or, um, the end of July this past year, um, in that there was a, uh, a statement allowing um, universities that have had approval from the Ohio Department of Ag, which is who was given control over the hemp program, um, we could uh, um, ask for approval from them to work and start researching hemp uh, before they got the um, full licensing program, commercial licensing program up and available. Uh, so we are able to, we started that um, and planted uh, last August and we are able to get a little bit of data and do some educational awareness for the crop um, in Ohio State I know was able to do so as well. Um, at the end of December, Ohio State, or Ohio, went from being one of the last states to have a hemp program to being one of them to be the, f of the first three approved for the, uh, in, relation to the federal rules that are out. Um, the, what they're calling the interim federal rules. Those are set to be finalized later down the line, but they're trying to gather information from all the state programs um, to operate the national program. And so the Ohio rules match um, what have been proposed for the federal program. And so um, at the end of January or middle of January, um, Ohio finalized its rules um, as they were submitted to the federal government. And as of today, they were actually, um, oh, the licenses are open for applications. Um, people have been waiting for that for a while. Um, and so this has actually been, uh, the Ohio Department of Ag has actually done a very good job. I've seen states that have taken far longer to get uh, commercial uh, licenses up and running. So um, they've done quite a good job, even though there's been a number of setbacks for them along the way. So this is uh, looking at how we differentiate hemp from marijuana. And so I mentioned at the very beginning uh, that it's due to this, the content of the THC. Uh, and so anything with less than 0.3% THC classifies legally as hemp, both at a state and federal level. Anything more than that still classifies as marijuana. And so this is a, just the question to see everybody's input. Which of these plants is hemp and which of these is marijuana in here? Anybody have an idea? No. Nobody could tell the difference. Those are actually all hemp plants. You can see the differences in how they look. Um, there's no way to sit there and look at the plant and say this is a hemp plant, that is a marijuana plant. So the only way to, to uh, differentiate hemp from marijuana is looking at that THC level, um, having samples collected and analyzed by a laboratory. Uh, and so that's uh, something that's a little, or actually quite unique for this crop. You have to have um, the, the plants sampled to make sure they're compliant um, with the regulations. And so, you know, most people don't like chemistry, but this is a plant that if you're going to get into working with it, you need to at least understand some basic chemistry. And so, one of the things we have here is the plant itself makes this compound called te delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinolic acid, or THCA for short. And when you heat that, so that's what the plant makes. What we're regulating is this THC over here. So what happens is, um, particularly during the heating process, but some storage and other factors play a role, 
as well, you get this loss of this carbon dioxide group, and it goes from a relatively non-intoxicating cannabinoid into an intoxicating cannabinoid. And so it has this potential, um, this THCA has this potential to be an intoxicating component. And so um, when the state of Ohio was setting up its regulations and following the new federal guidelines, it went with what we call a total THC approach, which means you do take the amount of THC plus the amount of THCA in the plant because the plant's naturally producing, uh, you only have very trace levels of this oftentimes in fresh plant material because this decarboxylation is not happening in the plant most, often, most of the time. And so, but we want to know the intoxicating potential of that plant. So we know, we know if it's hemp or marijuana. Um, and other states do calculate this differently. This has caused a lot of headache and confusion within the industry space. Um, but this is Ohio's definition. It does match um, the federal defini definition, at least at this point in time. Um, and so th there is this conversion factor here, and that's just a simply a weight conversion between these two compounds for the loss of that carbon dioxide. So that's where that uh, multiplier in front of it comes from. So essentially, you're adding these two components together. Now, the pl hemp plant produces over 120 different cannabinoids, including all these, um, or these three down here. Um, again, they're producing them in the, what we call the acidic form um, or the acid form. Uh, which then upon decarboxylation go to these neutral forms. And so that's where we get these compounds like cannabidiol or CBD or cannabigrol or CBG that you'll hear um, for these different types of plants that are out on the market um, to grow for these particular compounds. So when we're quantifying this, there's the definition seems relatively straightforward. You know, there's less than 0.3% THC, okay? So if we're looking at total THC, we do THC plus the THCA. But um, we know there's an inherent variability within the analytical process of testing for metabolites. And this goes for any plant metabolite, not just THC. There's margins of errors from the machine, from handling samples, and just all throughout the process. There's slight variations that even if two people are trying to do the exact same process identically, there's just going to be inherent a little bit of variability within that. And so um, if you go over that 0.3% limit, the grower has to destroy the crop. And that's going to be a complete loss to them. There is no compensation for that. And so this is something that nobody really takes lightly because we realize there's, the regulators realize there's this uh, serious financial impact on the grower if their crop test hot. And so to address this, um, if you have one lab test the sample, it may test 0.29 and be compliant. If it has another lab test it, you may be 0.31 and it may be incompliant. And so that, because of that inherent variability. And so what the USDA and its new regulations has put forth and what um, Ohio's adopt is what we call this acceptable THC level. And basically this accounts for the measurement of variability within the machine during the process. And so I'll illustrate that. So if you have example one here, your crop, hemp crop comes back and it's tested at 0.25% THC. Well, here you have no problem. You're under 0.3, nothing to be worried about. Okay. In example two, if you have your crop comes back and test 0.33 on the THC, under this acceptable THC level definition, now we look at the inherent margin of error for the machine and the equipment and all the testing process. And we see that'd be 0.04 in this hypothetical case. So in this case, we have 0.33 minus 0.04 and you get 0.29 is the low end of what that margin of error may be for that machine on that, on that reading, okay? And so since this spans that 0.3 value, this is now considered an acceptable level of THC because it, that just from the margin, the reason that sample may be over the legal limit is because of the machine and just the testing process. So 
th in this case, that sample would be deemed compliant, even though it's technically over that 0.3 th or that 0.3 limit. But it's because of that margin of error, it becomes acceptable. In contrast, if you have your crop comes back and test 0.36, and the margin of the error is 0.04 you wind up with 0.32 is the low value and so it doesn't span that 0.3 percent limit and so that is over the limit that legally classifies as marijuana and that crop must be destroyed okay so this is uh, something a little new not a, this was um until the usda issued the federal regulations this really wasn't in anybody's picture on the states um, doing hemp research and so this was kind of a new concept for everybody um, you'll hear, I know we have um, Jim coming up to talk after the break, so I'm not going to belabor too much of the details on the requirements, but um, there are requirements for a, a licensing application. Um, basically, you're looking at your address, GPS coordinates for where it's going to be grown, um, the number of acres or square foot if it's indoors, as well as there's a thousand plant minimum for either of those types of locations in Ohio. And so that thousand plant minimum is a little unique to Ohio. Um, it's not something other states necessarily, excuse me, do. Um, there is no, there's a couple restrictions. No planting within 100 feet of a residence. Uh, no fi planting 500 feet of a park or a school or within a half mile of a medical marijuana cultivator. Uh, the medical marijuana cultivators are all indoors, but they were concerned about um, pollination of their material, which would ruin the value of their medical marijuana uh, products. Um, the residency, these are requirements that people like, where do these come from, and wondering where, where they, uh, why we deal with them. Within the residencies, because um, some states have had a number of issues with uh, people trying to grow a few hemp plants in their house and they don't want to have to have the state agents going into people's homes uh, to test things and also it really becomes difficult to tell a hemp plant <laughs> when sampling <laughs> if it, it, you're going to have plants that look like marijuana growing inside. Um, so they wanted to keep it out of people's houses um, so there were, um, a number of states have adopted a minimum distance and then um, Hemp has a number of pests, but one of the primary pests is a very two-legged kind. Um, and people walking off with hemp growers' plants thinking it's something else, or even not thinking it's something else, and just stealing these high-value high plants. And so uh, if you're near a park or a school, you tend to have a lot of high school, middle school students that really don't know the difference between the two and just asking for a whole bunch of problems. So there's a distance away from them to avoid that issue. So that that's really for everybody's benefit to have that minimum distance there. A general timeline for hemp production. Um, this is a very general timeline for the on the regulatory side. Um, but usually the applications are going to be open November 1st to March 31st um, this year because of the late start of the program. I believe the email said they were extending them to May 1st this year because of the delays and not getting them open till today. Um, 15 days prior to the harvest, so there will be a planting report submitted saying that you planted X number of acres or square feet in number of plants. Um, there's other reporting requirements that go along with that. Um, but 15 days prior to the intended harvest, you're going to submit an intent to harvest report to the ODA. They're going to come and say, okay, we need to collect samples to make sure this crop is compliant. They'll come out, collect those samples, um, at which point you could either harvest or wait till it comes back to harvest. Um, they'll give you an okay if it's an acceptable level, then um, that crop could be sold. If it doesn't, um, and for some reason it fails, a secondary test could be ordered, although that costs um, additional money because they have to send people back out um, to re recollect samples and stuff again. But that is an option. If that second test fails though, then that crop will be destroyed. So we're looking at all this and you're probably wondering why are we going to all this headache? Um, 
And the reason for that is there's a lot of uses for hemp. Um, well, there's three major crops. There's, uh, it could be grown for fiber, which is what a lot of people think of when they hear hemp. It could also be grown for grain. Um, it's got a very nutritious seed. Um, and, it, and it also could be grown for the non-intoxicating metabolites, so the CBD or the CBG uh, within the plant that have potential medicinal values or other value. And so overall, there's an estimated 25 plus thousand uses for the plant. And so there's the, a lot of options that could be potentially done with this crop. Um, it's viewed as a very quite sustainable crop. And so um, with the movement towards sustainability, this is a really um, a key interest. And so there is an inherent value associated with having hemp in the product. Uh, with the flowers, this is just um, a little bit about the three major crops. So for metabolites, you're looking at the flowers. Um, this is a male flower. This is actually one individual female flower. People typically, within the industry, they call the whole thing the flower, but that's actually an inflorescence. Um, one individual flower is this little brack, and they have these little two little pistils coming out of this. And you notice all these little white dots on the outside of that brack. And those are what we call trichomes, and that's where those cannabinoids and terpenes are being produced. And so that's really what we're after. And so the highest level of those is on female flowers. And the, to maximize production of that, you try to avoid pollination with the male plants um, so as to maximize the continued growth of those female flowers and the swelling of those trichomes um, instead of shifting that towards seed development. Seeds, if, you, if the crop gets pollinated, you get seeds. Um, these are very nutrient dense, they're high in a lot of vitamins. Um, they've got a very balanced uh, fatty acid profile of omega-3s, omega-6s. So they're a very healthy seed um, on the fat content, a lot of antioxidants in them. Um, it's an easily digestible, high quality protein. So overall, it makes an excellent food source. Almost all the grain at this point in time really goes into food products. And so you'd be handling it like you would be handling a food grade crop. Um, so there's gonna be a little more, you're gonna wanna make sure everything's handled a lot more cleanly than you would just say with your corn and soybeans. That's gonna more likely wind up in animal feed. Uh, and then the longest and oldest use for the hemp crop or hemp plant is for the fibers. And so this is what we call a bass fiber plant. Uh, this is where the, fi that means the fibers come from the stem. And here you can see the long fibers pulled away from the inside of this woody core. Um, which we call the herd. Um, so the, the herd's got a composition fairly similar to a, a very light woody stick. Um, it's very light material, but it has a composition of just similar to wood. But this fiber on the outside is very high cellulosic content, which um, in very high purity, um, 75, 85% cellulose. And so you're getting something that's a very strong fiber. Um, and that's really what the interest for industrial applications is. And so um, one of the common uses for the fiber is in car parts, is actually using them in car uh, panels because it could provide that cellulose um, fiber, could provide that strength similar to you would with a fiberglass but at a fraction of the weight. And so you could keep that higher fuel efficiency while reducing, uh, while maintaining that structural integrity of the vehicle. Um, so, not so many American cars at this point, but foreign cars in particular use a fair bit of hemp fiber in their production. Um, so again, so that was the overview of that kind of three major crops, the fiber, the grain, and the metabolites. Um, come on. We do have what I call supporting crops for this, and this is either certified seed, non-certified seed production, or clones, and so this would be um, people growing material that would support the hemp farmer. So like you're being growing a, um, seed uh, for grain, or, um, not grain, sorry. Uh, the seed would be for planting, the clones would be for planting metabolite crops. I'm not gonna cover those in much detail. Those are a little more specific examples. Um, when we're talking about hemp, there's some differences in terminology. 
you'll hear what we call cultivars or varieties and what we call strains. And strains is not really typically a botanical term, but it's widely used within the cannabis space. Um, cultivars and varieties, those are like what you think of for any um, plant, where they've been traditionally bred to a high level of genetic uniformity, so you know what you're going to get when you plant that, that seed out in the field. Strains, on the other hand, are genetically very unstable. They're just somebody's crossed something, they like that plant, so they're going to sell it to you as is. Um, typically, these are all going to be for metabolites, whereas your cultivars are going to be either grain or fiber types. Um, and so that strain terminology comes actually out of the um, marijuana industry, and that's because all the genetics for this essentially derive from marijuana. Um, so with fiber production, we have um, we have grain, or we have um, sorry, we have fiber and what we call dual purpose varieties, which are grain or fiber. You're typically planting these at very high densities. You're looking at uh, 30 to 35 plants per square foot. Um, you want them very tightly packed so they force to get as tall as possible, no branches, um, thin stems so that maximizes the fiber production on the outside and minimizes that inner woody herd. Um, and you really want that height because that's where you're getting that biomass is going to um, be what you're paid off of for the yield. So really you want plants in excess of 10 feet tall. The closer to 15, 14, 15 feet you can get this, the better. These are going to be harvested around mid-August. Um, typically when the male plants are in the middle or finished flowering, um, which for Ohio is going to be around mid-August here. Because it's a very photo uh, responsive plant, um, it says a uh, it's very easy, straightforward to predict when it's actually going to flower. Once that fiber um, stalk has been cut, they're going to um, usually that's with a sickle bar or um, uh, some type of cutting implement similar to that. It's going to be left to rot in the field for two to six weeks or more. Really depends on the moisture for a process we call redding, which is essentially a controlled rotting where we allow bacteria and fungi from the soil and the air to land on the plants and decay that, um, partially decay that stem to loosen those fibers from that inner woody, inner woody herd. Um, and so that makes it easier for the decorticator to process, so that'd be the processor for it. Um, currently, there's low demands and low returns um, for fiber because there's a lack of infrastructure. That's our big problem with fiber at the moment is there's not enough companies uh, processing it. Um, it takes a lot of money to get it involved in fiber processing and it takes a long time to pay that equipment off um, for this type of crop. Um, we don't have the best variety suited to U.S. production at the moment, um, but again our biggest uh, issues with infrastructure. For grain, here you could use grain or these dual purpose varieties. Again, those could be used for fiber or grain. Uh, most of those are coming out of Europe, um, although some come from Canada. This is where you're actually actively trying to get the grain. Um, so you're gonna have males and female plants in the field. You're gonna plant about half the density you would for um, fiber. So about um, 10 to 15 plants per square foot. Uh, this is, and you don't want the plants to get as tall. Um, you still don't really want bushy, but you just don't want them to get as tall um, and have as much competition so they could develop that full flower head. Really, you want plants about five to six feet tall. Anybody got an idea why you don't want to go over about six feet tall with a grain plant? A lot of material will run through the combine. Yes, that's exactly the problem. Um, it found Kentucky found out very early on the first year tried doing grain production there was at least two different combines caught fire um, and literally burnt up because they tried to cut it at the stalks at the base of the plant and run the whole material through well even though this is being grown for grain it is still a fiber plant those fibers 
wraparound gears of combines and will literally stop them. <laughs> and then you have to get in with razor blades to cut those off um, and get wrapped up around things. So the best way to harvest for grain is to actually go right below that grain head and you have to be able to get that the grain head on the combine up high enough to get right under that grain head. Um, so you can minimize the amount of uh, grain running through, or minimize the amount of stock material running through um, to avoid those tying up issues. You also have to go very slowly even with that because um, the plants are susceptible to shattering the seed and so the plants are gonna, to avoid that problem, you don't harvest when the plants fully mature. It's only partially mature at that point in time. Um, the rough value people throw out is about 70%, uh, although there's a lot of debate on whether uh, that's uh, the best recommendation or not and what 70% actually means. But that means you're going to have green, <laughs> true fresh green material going through there. The, this grain head is going to look very similar to this when it's um, actually going through the combine. It's going to be very green and leafy and wet. Um, the grain itself is going to be anywhere from 12 to 20 plus percent moisture on it. And so you have to go very slow um, just so, because of all that wet material as well. Um, one of the tricks with uh, the grain is it's a little different than other grain crops is because of its high polyunsaturated fats in it, those omega-3s, omega-6s, um, it could go rancid real quickly. And so it needs to be even though it starts out very wet, it needs to be dried down um, consistently. Not necessarily fast, but it needs to be dried down at a consistently um, and put into a drying system right away. And we're looking at a grain system that's not one of those that propane furnaces that you feed it in one end and it comes out a, a few hours later dry out the other end. Those, shad those will split the seeds and run the seeds in, in a separate, different, may different way. Um, so they need to be put under forced air um, with some heat, but it's going to be a slow heat to just dry it in the grain bin, lots of agitation um, to keep from developing hot spots within that bin. Uh, there's pretty strong demands and good returns at this point for it. Um, uh, the grain's one of the more successful markets at the moment. That's pretty much what we're buying. We're still buying a lot of material from Canada to fill that particular market. And a good yield for uh, grain production, we are shooting around that thousand pounds an acre mark. Um, it's not uncommon to go less than that, particularly the first year or so, um, trying to grow grain crop. Um, some places further north where it's a little drier have gotten in excess of that. Um, uh, the main challenge with grain is the shattering issue. Um, you could lose a lot of grain very quickly um, and by quickly I mean you could lose tens to fifties of pounds of seed per acre per day if it's caught at the wrong time. So you could lose a lot of grain very quickly off the plant. Um, so if it gets too dry and you get a strong rainstorm or a windstorm come through it will dislodge a huge amount of grain and it'll just wind up on the ground and there's nothing you could do about it. Uh, you'll have a nice stand of volunteer hemp the next year, which you'll have to control. Uh, but that's about all that it's, will come out of that. Uh, the last category is typically the one the most popular at the moment because this is where people had been seeing dollar signs. And I say had been because at the moment the market is very saturated and um, people are having a hard time even selling. Um, the biomass that they've produced this past year. Uh, but this has mostly grown for CBD, although there is CBG plants that came out on the market this last year, and so they'll probably be a lot more prevalent this year. Um, these are all derived from marijuana genetics, so they're all susceptible to testing hot. Um, part of that's because you try to push the CBD levels up as high as you can as a grower because you're being paid by percentage point of CBD per pound of material. And so to get the most CBD, there, you tend THC levels slowly track along with that. And so the higher the CBD levels go up, the higher the THC levels go up, and the more likely you're to test non-compliant. 
Um, so when growing this crop, it's, you have to do monitoring very closely um, to, with um, sending samples in for THC testing just to make sure, okay, you know what the THC level is at this point in time and you can get an idea of when you actually need to harvest that plant to so it's still com a still compliant crop. Um, these are either started from clones or seeds. Um, the clones of the seeds would be started in a greenhouse and then transplanted out. Clones are directly transplanted into the field um, after rooting uh, in a greenhouse. Anywhere on a six by six spacing is common, although you're really anywhere from a thousand to twenty five hundred plants per acre. Um, people do less, people do more than that. So there's really no standard rate on that at this point in time. Um, each clone's about two to five dollars per clone. Uh, it's probably going to be on the lower end of that this coming year. Um, likely. It's hard telling. Nobody ever knows with the market on this stuff. Um, it is a high labor cost. With few exceptions, it is mostly a hand done crop. It's very similar to tobacco in most systems. Um, where you're going to have to go in, um, once you transplant it, you're going to have to do weed control of some form, either with plastic, but um, really that's the straightforward part if you have plastic. It's the hand cutting every plant and hand hanging the plant to dry or cutting off those flowers to run through a dryer. Um, there's a whole bunch of different ways this could be handled, uh, but they're all very labor intensive. Um, and people tend to have a hard time keeping a consistent labor supply doing this because after the first several days, their labor is like, this is too much work, we're not doing this. Um, so uh, having a consistent labor supply is important. Um, this shouldn't be, there has been a high demand for it, but the returns at this point are questionable. Uh, last I knew it was about a dollar a pound per percentage point. So. Um, to give you an idea where that started out about four years ago, that was about $4 a percentage point. So it's dropped that much. Um, and it was about $2 last fall when people were started harvesting. So it's dropped quite a bit since then. So there's been a lot of value lost in that crop. Um, whether those prices, how and when they're gonna stabilize, really don't know. Um, so it's not uh, um, the best market time to be jumping in that. So uh, one of our previous speakers was talking about, you know, you have this curve where technology is coming along for the drones, then it's, there's a peak interest, and now, then there's a valley at the bottom where everybody's like, oh, this has got lots of problems. Yeah, we're in that phase right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> A couple years, just a couple years ago, it was like right nice at the top of that peak, and everybody's like all excited. Um, the market's not all that great at the moment. Um, problems with the metabolite crops are the THC levels and testing hot, um, although some of the CBG plants should avoid some of that um, problem. Um, but then the issue with those is that doesn't necessarily have the same market as CBD does. Um, Labor supplies, um, concerns about nearby hemp pollen, uh, that's a common one. Um, people growing these metabolite crops don't want their flowers pollinated. Um, so if there's any other hemp around in the area, um, that's a cause of concern. And how to store dry large volumes of the, that material and store those flowers um, without getting any degradation of any form is also a, a challenge. Um, there's mechanical equipment being developed, but it's not widely deployed at this point in time, and it's expensive. Since this is a tillage conference, and, or a conservation tillage conference, I wanted to put in a slide about this. Um, this is not necessarily the best crop for conservation tillage. Um, some people have tried it in Kentucky. Um, I don't think they went back to try it again. It did that well. Um, it like, it's a very weak seedling. It likes a very fine, firm seed bed. And um, so it really likes soils that have been deeply tilled and are very light, are very fluffy that they get good contact with the seed when the planter runs through and over top of them. 
The metabolite crops also are usually plants into very til well tilled soils um, because you're going to be shaping beds a lot of times and laying down plastic mulch. Um, so it's not exactly at this time conducive for conservation type tillage practices, although there's definitely research that needs to be done um, looking at that. Um, because a lot of that we just really haven't looked at in any depth. Uh, if you're thinking about growing hemp, um, these are some points that you really need to consider. <coughs> First off, and then this is a rough order about how you want to think about them. Start out by thinking about what type of hemp you're interested in growing, be that grain fiber or metabolites. Um, figure out where you would put it. Hemp likes good ground, doesn't like wet feet, um, likes well-drained soils. If it's a good soil for other crops, it's going to be likely a good soil for hemp. Um, evaluate what kind of facilities and equipment you may have um, because those are going to dictate how much you need to plant. Um, you don't want to plant more than you can handle. Otherwise, you could lose money very quickly, and a lot of people have run into that problem, not realizing how much space um, hemp plants could take. Uh, one large hemp plant for metabolite production for drying can take up to 16 plus square feet, cubic feet of space for drying. You don't get a lot of plants in an area with that much space. Um, you may even want to go wider than that because you need good ventilation to keep those plants from uh, getting mold and stuff while drying. Um, Determine the type of uh, the amount you want to plant. Um, going back to those, what facilities and equipment you have and the labor you have access to. Um, find somebody to an establish a contract with for that crop. Um, it's going to be hard to get contracts, particularly this coming year, uh, but those contracts solve a number of issues. One, you know you're going to have a buyer for that material. The other part is you also know what that particular buyer wants. Not every processor wants their plants the same way. They'll dry them differently, they'll um, process them, how they process them is different. So they're, um, they want specific varieties, they want specific harvest dates. There's a lot of things that'll be specified by a particular processor and that'll be unique to them. So it's also very useful in that regard to know what they specifically want from, the, from you. Figure out, um, some of that will help figure out what strain or variety you want. Uh, um, expect challenges. Everybody has challenges the first year with this plant. Nobody's an exception to that rule. Everybody's still learning about this plant. There's a lot we don't know. Um, it's very plastic to its environment. Um, and so it does a lot of things that you would not necessarily think a plant's gonna do. Um, Develop a financial plan. Um, this is really comes down to everybody's particular operation. There's no necessarily set um, guidelines for this. The University of Kentucky has a good website. If you go to the University of Kentucky Hemp, um, just type that in. They'll take you to their main their hemp web page, and um, down at the bottom of that page, there's a place where you could have access some Excel forms to plug in numbers. Um, for what you think you can make off the crop and how what your different types of expenses are Go do that um, because you're the only one that's gonna be able to figure out whether this is going to be right for your operation or not yeah. What do they buy? They buy the whole plant? Depends on the processor um, if you're selling for grain You're gonna be selling just the grain if you're selling for fiber. They're gonna buy bales of that redded fiber they're buying for floral material. It could be just the flower. It could be the whole plant. It could be whole plant without the stalks. This is where those contracts come in because every processor has different things they're going to buy. Um, and what one processor wants is not necessarily what the other one wants. So um, that's a good question. Um, once you've figured all that out and you still think, okay, I want to try growing some hemp, uh, go get a license and um, you're gonna have to have a license report all those coordinates those coordinates I for, should mention it's not because the government just wants to control everything you're doing those coordinates are actually used by the or collected by the ODA so they know where the fields are and then they can give those num or those locations to the state police so when they fly over in their unmarked helicopters they don't land on your property thinking you have an 
10 acres of weed growing out in your, in your <laughs> back property. That's not a good day for anybody. <laughs> so <laughs> those GPS coordinates are for your benefit <laughs> that those are being reported. They're giving them to the people that need to know that information or are gonna find out otherwise on their own in a less pleasant manner. Um, and that, that happens. <laughs> so um, that's what, there's a lot of things with that. Um, and I'm sure you'll hear more about that from the next speaker. Um, some final things, uh, if you're doing, when you do a contract, have a lawyer or somebody with experience evaluate that. Um, there's all sorts of different variations and they're not all good and a lot of them still have, that'll get drafted, have lots of problems. So have somebody with legal experience actually look over and help you with it. It's worth the investment. Um, start small, take some effort to figure out um, all the, what this crop likes. It's a very fun and rewarding plant, but it is very unique. And so I do recommend start small, um, usually an acre for metabolite material or maybe five, 10 acres of grain or fiber, something along that lines. Once you get that done, your first growing season, feel comfortable with it, then you could scale up um, as you have that experience. Um, good stand establishment is needed to avoid weed problems. Um, if you don't get that, it will be a weed, there will be weed problems. Um, and hemp does have some pest problems and disease problems, and I need to change this. As of about a month ago, there is some uh, a very, very few pesticides labeled for hemp. Um, they're not what a lot of people would consider the most effective type of pesticide. So um, essentially a lot of it's gonna be grown very organic type system uh, just by the nature of not having sufficient pesticides for the, for the crop. Um, and none of those are herbicides. Um, there's still some issues with banks and financing being worked out, although this is getting better. Um, and there is um, always this chance of a crop failure. A year like this past year, which was real wet, would, is awful for hemp. It does not like that standing water, so that will kill it very quickly. Um, and then there's a lot of charlatans within the space selling st um, seeds and clones. And so you really need to vet who you're working with um, so you know you're getting good quality material um, to start with. Uh, we are gonna, Central State's gonna host an event next week. For anybody interested, we have a flyer. Um, Dr. Cindy Folk back there has them on the table. Um, we're having a networking event where we're getting um, some processors together. They'll have some tables and then um, prospective growers can come in and network with them and try to develop um, those contracts and those agreements uh, for, for producing the crop. Um, so let one of us know if you want more information about that. Uh, if you want more information in detail about the production side, we have an extension bulletin we just put out, and we also have an extension bulletin we just put out about those um, getting started with the crops. So those things I was listing through about how to go about getting started with hemp production. That goes into more detail there. Um, so with that, I think I might have a little time for a few questions. Yeah. So um, with that, does anybody have any questions? Yes. So whether it's grain, fiber, or metabolites, it all has to be to be hemp. It has to be less than that 0.3 percent THC. Um, now I will say, if you're using cultivar grain and fiber cultivars um, that have been bred as traditional hemp varieties in other countries, not in the U those aren't coming from the U.S. at this point in time. Those are come from countries that have had hemp production longer than we have. Um, generally those are not going to be a concern because they've been selectively bred to meet that requirement. Um, that's not saying they couldn't be an issue. Generally they're not going to be an issue. Um, the real concern are the metabolite crops where you're pushing that CBD content um, and that THC content falls. 
Ned uses car parts. To me, if a farmer would put a bunch into the CBD type thing, I mean, I know it's yeah. the same uh, practice, but if it didn't make the grade, why couldn't they mow it down and put it into the... Well, so yeah, if it if it has taught moving it over Rather to a new use, it, yeah. yeah, there's been people pushing on that, and there is some progress being made on that with the USDA regulations. I don't know necessarily how Ohio will handle that, um, but they just the USDA just said okay, they're going to approve a few more methods for disposal of hot crops, but they're all going to be. So they're basically, if they're not going to be burnt, they're going to be buried in the soil somehow and tilled back in as a green manure crop. So they're still not making it to like people would like to see into those fiber or other applications um, like people would want to see. But part of that is a fiber, a good fiber plant is very different than a metabolite plant. You don't have those long fibers um, in those metabolite plants because you have all those branches interfering with that from the bushiness of the plant that disrupts those fiber bundles. Um, so there is some logistical issues with that as well. On the metabolites you were talking about since the, the ones with the higher CBDs are probably derived from the THC types mm -hmm. and that's why there's an issue with THC being mm -hmm. You kind of made a comment harvest, do some of these get higher THC contents as they, the same plant get higher as it goes on that could cause a problem? Yes, yeah, so no, so each, as the plant's maturing, the, the, the metabolite content, content of CBD and THC is increasing generally. Uh, it may fluctuate a little bit, but the general trend as the plant ages, the, the flower ages, it's going up. Yes, the THC level parallels that because the enzyme responsible for making that T or CBD is leaky and makes some THC in the process. Okay. So that's why they track together. So the only way to get it is to cut that THC level off and that's, yes. Yeah, so that's why when you're doing the metabolite crop you want to monitor you know, start several weeks after flowering and monitor at least weekly, send samples off, say, okay, what's the THC content? What's the THC content? There's no on-farm test you could do at this point, um, so it's sending those samples to a lab. Um, not directly, no. <laughs> it's not making any more new metabolites once it's cut. Um, there's some conversion issues, but that's more of the where that THCA starts to convert to that THC itself. So you get that kind of chemistry going on. But there's a lot we don't know on that in that part. <laughs> How many licensed growers are in Kentucky? Oh, this last year, I think they had about 1,200 licensed and they had I think in the end they had upwards of 50,000 acres approved. I don't know how much actually got planted and how much got harvested. So. What's the ratio from fiber to seed growth? Oh, for what, like the number of people growing it? For production. Oh, yeah, for production. Um, Is it more for the seed or more? Uh, it's much more for the grain. Um, the markets, most states have about 80 plus percent for the metabolites, about 5 percent for the fiber, and the rest is kind of grain. Um, so is there a high, higher value for the fiber then or not? No, the fiber at the moment is the lowest value. Um, and it's also got the most, the least number of people that could process it because there's not that infrastructure. Yeah, um, we're going to find out very shortly because the licenses for those also open today. Um, and so, if I'm correct. <laughs> that, that will all be a public record. 
yeah so you'll be able to see that uh, yeah you'll be able to see that um, going forward at the moment though nobody's been licensed yet because it just started um, so that's why the event we're hosting was people that I've been working with I know are going to apply for those licenses um, they don't have a license yet um, because nobody does but um, their their company is working on getting well established in that space so uh, we do know there will be processors um, how how many and where don't know at this point how many processors are there in Kentucky that's a good question I don't know what the last count was I've heard last I knew they had over 120 I think they might be up to close to 200 now um, although they did have one very big processor just go bankrupt so that uh, put a put a big damper on the industry because that company had contracted I think about 10,000 acres worth of material so, so yeah just a contract doesn't necessarily mean people are safe <laughs> um, yeah Uh, no. <laughs> no, that would be the easy way. Um, <laughs> uh, somebody from the ODA is going to have to come out and witness that destruction um, to validate that it was destroyed in an appropriate manner. Um, so I'm sure Jim could give you more details on that. But um, yeah, I, I, for the longest time, the irony there was, you know, the only way to destroy it was to burn it. And, uh, <laughs> You test it, test it hot, and classifies it as marijuana, so let's burn it. Um, uh, I love the irony in that one. I always have. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, recently, I've heard of uh, THCP, which is, I guess, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, inevitable to get that question. How is that determined? So that was just a recently found molecule in some marijuana genetics in Italy. Um, and I, it was not at a very high level in the plant. It just seems to be very super potent. Um, I can speculate about the origin of that, but we don't know. Um, it's unlikely to be prevalent in a lot of cannabis at this point though.